Good afternoon. This is one of those classes that for some reason got sold out and uh, a lot of people are joining in right at 12. So it's given them a minute for them to go ahead and join us. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. It is Friday, the fourth growth Friday, 12 o'clock, and I am getting ready to go ahead and get started. For those who are joining us, this is a session on the top misunderstood forms and upcoming for the next Fridays, we have the schedule set out. I am proud of myself that I was able to get it done all the way to March. Today, we're talking about the misunderstood forms in Maryland, assuming that all of you are licensed in Maryland and also are members of Maryland Realtors, because that's what I'm going to focus on. All of these sessions are available by you going to training with Brenda, or you can find me by going to brendacasuva.com. You will all get follow up to encourage you to be able to schedule for those sessions. To my guests that I haven't met yet, my name is Brenda Kasuva, and we can continue this conversation online by us connecting on social media, email, contact information, scheduling a session with me by going to brendacasuva.com. If you are now comfortable with QR codes, you are able to scan that QR code that is being presented right now on your phone or just go to brandacasuva.com. I think everyone is all set and we are going to get started on why it is you are here. But I always have now been getting this question a lot. So I have I'm upgrading baby steps is the sessions are usually recorded. You are welcome to find me on YouTube if you just search for Brenda Kasuva or when you go to Brenda Kasuva, you will see some of the recordings that are available for you to engage in at a later time. Today's session is on misunderstood forms. I am getting myself ready to talk about that. I'm only going to talk about six. I know I'll be talking fast because I know I'll be getting questions and we'll see whether we are able to cover all six. The top confusing forms in Maryland, just based on mentorship, with my mentees based on when I teach continuing education as well. And now I am volunteering as a member of the statewide forms of Maryland Realtors. And what that means real quick is all the forms that you see come from somewhere and they come from realtors such as myself who are volunteering to be part of that process. Then there are lawyers involved who draft the documents. And then we have the executive board at Maryland Realtors that are normally going to approve the forms. We know that the forms are usually out on October 1st. So we have the Maryland Realtors forms that we're able to use and your local associations also have their forms. And then your broker might also have their forms as well. The other person that does participate in this conversation is the Real Estate Commission. And the Real Estate Commission does provide us with forms that I'm going to engage in. At least two of them do show up on the top six. And that is going to be the disclosure forms. We're going to get into the agency disclosure forms, the understanding whom agents represent, the consent to dual agency, and the disclosure disclaimer. Those are the top three. No matter where you are, as long as you're licensed in Maryland, you're going to engage with those documents. And they do help you when you're working with the public to make sure that when anything goes wrong, hopefully that's not the reason. The form wasn't the reason that caused the complaint. You want to make sure that all of these forms are filled out correctly and that you understand what they are talking about. 
The next one in this market has to do with inspections, the as-is conversation, which leads to the property inspection addendum, how those two don't match um, and have a different conversation and what happens when people are asking for repairs and it was being sold as is. So we're going to talk about that. And finishing off is the first time home buyer addendum. This is always a conversation still happening when I'm receiving offers or reviewing offers on behalf of my mentees. Yes, this is still happening. So we're going to review that. Let's see where we're going to start off with. And that is on the agency disclosures. When you have a question, put it in the chat box. Also put it, uh, you can speak by activating your microphone and I will normally slow down to allow you to be able to ask your questions. When I start off with the agency disclosure forms, I start with the one that all of us are introduced to when you're taking the brokerage relationship and disclosure class, continuing education. It's also part of when you're taking the licensing class as well. This particular document comes from the Real Estate Commission. It's a notice, it's not a contract. So today is not a CE class here. We are talking about what we should be doing on this particular form. So these two pages to start off with, when is it applicable? When is the understanding home agents represent applicable? It's only applicable when you are engaging with the public and that person does not have an agreement with you. I will keep reviewing that. That person does not have an agreement with you. Let's talk about examples. You're the listing agent, and let's say it's Stephanie, who's a listing agent. She has a listing, and now she's getting calls from buyers who want to check out the house. Stephanie, the listing agent, is going to ask these buyers, do you have an agent? They're going to respond, whatever they respond. If it is no, Stephanie's going to take their word for it and not start saying, show me proof that you don't have an agent. She's going to take their word for it, and then she's going to schedule an appointment and show her listing. When Stephanie meets with this buyer, then she's going to give them the understanding home agents represent because she's not representing them. Uh, the seller is already spoken for, so she's going to educate them that you're not represented. I am speaking on behalf of the seller. The next time you might need it is, let's flip it. So let me pick someone else. We have Michelle and Michelle has a buyer. And this buyer and Michelle don't have an agreement yet. So Michelle is meeting a buyer. She doesn't have an agreement yet. And Michelle wants to show this buyer some properties. So when Michelle is going out there, she doesn't have an agreement with the buyer. She will need to give this buyer the understanding home agents represent when she is showing either company listing, Michelle is with EXP, she will have to give them the understanding home agents represent regardless of which property she's going to be showing. We'll talk about whom she's working for in that particular instance in a couple of minutes. The next scenario that you're going to have the understanding home agents represent is when Michael has a buyer and Michael is showing a for sale by owner Michael and buyer have an agreement. The buyer has signed a buyer agency agreement. And please know when I'm saying buyer, it's applicable on the tenant and landlord side. Michael and the buyer have an agreement. This buyer wants to look at for sale by owner. Michael is going to give the understanding home agents represent to who? The for sale by owner. Why? The for sale by owner is not represented. So those are the times that you're going to need the form echoing the statement. You need it when the person does not have an agreement with you. And we're going to now go into the form with the review of when you give it to the person who is a customer, they have the opportunity to sign it. If they don't sign it, we know we sign it and keep it in our records for 
five years in Maryland. Now let's go through the form. I'm going straight to page two of the understanding home agents represent. Here's where, when, I think I used Stephanie. So Stephanie has a listing. And let's assume Stephanie here works for EXP Realty. So this is how it's going to be filled out, which company you work for, your name. And we're going to check off the box of seller landlord when Stephanie is showing her listing to a buyer that told her that they are not represented. So that's going to be filled out this way. And then Stephanie is going to keep this for her records for five years. The other scenario that usually comes about is, let's assume now Michelle. So Michelle is showing a buyer, a property. Michelle doesn't have an agreement with this buyer. And the property that Michelle is showing is listed by EXP. Michelle is with EXP. The buyer doesn't have an agreement with Michelle. Michelle is going to give this buyer the document and it's going to be filled out this way. Now, why is it being filled out this way? The seller hired EXP as the broker. Therefore, all the agents under that company are working for the seller as the seller's agents. So when Michelle with EXP goes to show a property listed by EXP, and this buyer doesn't have an agreement with Michelle, this is how you're going to fill out that form. So Michelle with EXP Realty going to put in the seller landlord agent boxes checked off and the buyer signs it. I'll keep going for a couple more minutes and then check in if there are any questions. So when you're showing a listing, listed by your company or you're the listing agent to a consumer, you've seen how you fill it out. Now let's go further to the next scenario of sub-agent. So sub-agent would be, what would be the scenario for sub-agent is, Stephanie is with, um, and Stephanie, I'm drawing a blank, which company you're affiliated with. <laughs> so Stephanie's I'm with Stephanie 21. Oh, I know there, there are two Stephanies today. Tell me, oh. Stephanie P, which one you're, you're affiliated with? Uh, Century 21, the real estate center. Okay, so Century 21, the real estate center is where Stephanie P is affiliated with. And she has the listing. So when she's showing any of her listings to a buyer that doesn't have an agreement, we've covered that. So now let's go through the other scenario. And I'm just going, oh, there are a lot of people waiting. Sorry. So I'm going to go through the scenario of picking someone else, Roseanne. So Roseanne is affiliated, I believe, with Calder Banker. So Roseanne, you're affiliated with Calder Banker. And you have a buyer, Brenda, who's meeting you. And buyer Brenda doesn't have an agreement with you, Roseanne. When you go show me a long and foster listing, when you go show me a Century 21 downtown listing, a Century 21 new millennium, a Keller Williams gateway, a EXP listing, ETC, you get the idea. Roseanne is going to give me this form and she's going to select what? Sub-agent? Sub-agent of the seller. Yes. Thank you. Sub-agent of the seller. So sub-agent of the seller, why? The buyer doesn't have an agreement with Roseanne. And Roseanne is showing a property listed by a different company. That's when you're going to select sub-agent. And then we know the person signs it. If the person doesn't sign it, then we know we're going to certify at the bottom that we did what we were supposed to do, and we keep that in our records for five years. This is probably the highlight of the document. One is the sub-agent box. Hopefully that helps. The second part of this document is the buyer-tenant agent box. When is that checked? This is only checked when you... Michael, the buyer agent of Brenda, I have an agreement with you. And now Michael is showing me a for sale by owner. That is when this box is checked off. The moment that I sign a buyer agreement with Michael, 
we have an agreement, this form is not needed. This form is only needed when you do not have an agreement. And what is an agreement? A buyer agency agreement, a tenancy agreement, or a listing agreement to lease it or to sell it. This is where I pause before I jump over to dual agency. Questions, comments on that topic of the understanding whom agents represent. On your example, the picture said seller signature as when you were saying buyer's agent. So yes. are we saying we need, I thought we went away from having to hand that to the seller every time. This is only the seller that's a for sale by owner. Okay. Yes. Okay. It would be the Facebook that has to sign it, correct? Correct. The for sale by owner seller, yes. I guess if I'm okay. saying that correctly, yes. So for yeah. so when I go show a for sale by owner, that owner who's selling their house is not represented. Therefore, they're going to sign this form. And if they don't, remember we fill out page at the bottom where I, the agent, will certify. Did that help? Yeah, that helps. But if you have a buyer agency agreement with a buyer, you're, they're going to always sign as a buyer's agent anyway. Wouldn't you present this form to them if they're doing a buyer agency agreement? No. Or you don't need Okay, all right. No, no. So Sherry, and, uh, once we get married with an agreement, we don't need this form. We have the marriage certificate, which is the easy. agreement. Brenda, the easiest way for anybody to remember this is one of the parties must be unrepresented. Right, right. Only if someone's unrepresented. Thank you, ladies. Okay. Yeah. Dual agency. In Maryland, dual agency is your broker or your broker designee. Who's your broker designee? That is your office manager or someone, again, that the broker has designated to be the dual agent. When, for example, your broker is a listing agent, so they can assign someone else to be the dual agent for that particular transaction. This is somebody that is selected by the broker to be the dual agent. Your team leader isn't. Your broker is your, is your dual agent. So here's where, or rather, is the dual agent in this transaction. This is where we now talk about these this particular form. The consent to dual agency for me, for lack of a better sentence, is going to be one that is signed up front, no matter where you end up, whether you end up, you know, when you go, if you're not going to have an agreement at this moment with the buyer, you still need consent for you to be able to show your company listing. So this one is one that I say consent is what? Permission. Consent is permission. So I need your permission, dear seller, for other agents in our company to show your house for the possibility of dual agency happening. Dear buyer, I need your permission to show you our company listing in the event that you end up purchasing this property. I need permission, buyer, tenant, landlord, or seller. So I need permission first. And again, seller is given permission up front for the property to be shown by other agents in that company. Buyer is given permission for you to show them a company listing. Whether you have an agreement or not, you need that permission. So let's, and then we talk about what confirmation, when it actually happens. The confirmation and permission is all in one document in order to try save paper, I guess. So let's review this on the form itself. When you meet with Sam the seller, Sam the seller during your listing appointment is going to give permission. You've put in the property address that you're listing and then Sam the seller is going to give permission. February the 2nd, Sam the seller signed that. And then you now let's totally, Sam the seller has signed it, you've listed. Now you meet Mary Buyer. Mary Buyer wants to start looking at properties. I'm going to say you should have your agreement signed up front, but that's not the conversation today. Your style of business could be different. 
Mary Baya is going to give permission for me to show her our company listing. So I'm getting permission up front. Then when Mary Baya purchases Sam Sellers listing, we're going to have both people sign at the bottom to confirm. Here's the confusion part. Some of you are trying to save steps or omit some steps and you're getting all of this stuff signed at once, whatever your reason is. And so while the file is being reviewed, this is where we pause and ask, did you get permission up front before showing the property? And then when the offer was being presented, now we have confirmation. So how you get caught is the dates matching. How is it Mary Buyer gave permission on February the 4th and then an offer was presented? In this market, I'm going to argue it's possible because we're moving fast where we meet a buyer today, we maybe show a house and we want to put in an offer. That's okay. You can explain that. But majority of the times uh, in this market as well, Mary Buyer met with you December. She went to put in an offer. It wasn't accepted. Now we're going. So you need permission up front for consent to do a agency permission up front and then confirmation when the offer is being presented. Let's iron it out. It's the same company. So same company. Century 21 downtown is different from Century 21 New Millennium. Keller Williams Integrity is different from Keller Williams Metropolitan. I'm saying it wrong. Metropolitan something. Those are two different companies. It has to be the same company is when we have dual agency. And just because the listing agent put it as part of your disclosures doesn't mean that the buyer now needs to put their signature. You're only having the buyer, or rather the buyer is only put in a signature if it is applicable. And it's only applicable when both individuals that are representing the people in this transaction work for the same company. Dear listing agent, now let, let me talk to you, dear listing agent. Buyer agent will come to you. Dear listing agent, when you are putting the documents onto the MLS, this is where we need, there's room for improvement. When you put in the documents into the MLS, some of us have the school of thought that I want all the documents in one packet. That's beautiful. However, there'll be times when some of the documents in this packet are not applicable. So maybe consider putting them separately. So I'm gonna show in the MLS, if you're using Bright MLS as a listing agent, as of yesterday, I think the system still works, you're able to add as many documents as you want. For those of us who have the school of thought that I want everything as one, that's okay, continue to do so, but consider maybe put in the, the dual agency document separately. And what I have done is when I am uploading the documents in the MLS, I spell it out what it is. So I know it's called the consent to dual agency, but further education for my people is I say this is only applicable to you if you're affiliated with my company. Otherwise, you don't need it. You don't need to download it, dear buyer agent, because it's only applicable when we are affiliated with the same company. Now, here's another PSA. Seller already hired you, dear listing agent. So we don't need what the understanding home agents represent to be uploaded to the MLS. Please, we don't need it. Now here, I'm not your broker. So if your broker is saying you have to, then follow what your broker says, because that's a person who's going to be giving you some of the money when the transaction closes. But here's where you don't need the understanding home agents to present and consider separating it just to help out the buyer agents. Dear buyer agent, when you're going to go to the MLS, then you know that you're going to pull up the listing. You're going to look at that note up at the top to get your disclosures. 
And then this is where we guide you on the documents. I chose the route of separating the agenda. This is my style. You could have a different one. But when you're looking at it, this is where I'm telling you, dear buyer agent, this is not applicable to you if you're not with the company that I am currently affiliated with. Feedback, comments. I have a question. Please. This is Lisa. I was wondering about the, you said the understanding who the agent represents, that you sometimes put that by itself. Could you repeat when that's? I never. Oh. I only put I was... the consent to do a agency by itself. Okay. So I, I so let, let's review. I never have the understanding whom agents are present as part of the disclosures. Why? Seller has already hired me. Once the seller signs the listing agreement, the understanding home agents or present notice is not applicable. So maybe it's flipping the practice. I am going out there to get hired. If and when I am not hired, that's when we have the conversation of the understanding home agents are present. The understanding home agents are present is only applicable to the person that has not hired me. So listing agent, seller has signed a listing agreement. We don't need the understanding home agents or present form. We do need consent to do a agency. Right. That's, I mean, I misspoke. That's what I'm saying. You don't necessarily upload the understanding whom I've seen it and I haven't understood it. Okay. I know. Got it. So hopefully the 25 of you here <laughs> are going to update our practice and tell others, but thank you for your question. Go ahead, Stephanie. Brenda, um, can you speak to the fact that you allow uh, the client portal visibility? See where you have that it's visible uh -huh. to the public? Uh-huh. You want to talk about that for a second because usually it's all knows from people but this way it allows buyers agents to or buyers to see these forms yes. when they get the listing yes yeah. perfect yep so thank you for adding that yes thank you for adding that and what stephanie is referencing to dear listing agent is where right. i i am going the route of I want the buyers to have it also up front because I don't know what the buyer agent is going to do or when they're going to give the documents to the buyer. So I turn it on for them to see it when they go to the portal that is offered through Bright MLS. Thank you for bringing that up, Stephanie. Yes, because when we as buyer's agent, send the buyer the listing, they can see these forms then by clicking the documents um, icon at the top. Yes. Unless the listing agent has put all no's, then Correct. they can't see it. Correct. Thank you for that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. Let's get into the conversation of the disclosure disclaimer. So my friends, we've covered the understanding whom agents are present. We've covered the dual agency. And now with your permission, we're getting into the disclosure disclaimer. Boy, is this one, oh boy. So let's see what we can iron out on the disclosure disclaimer. I am taking my time to make sure that I had it open and looks like I had not. So this is my opportunity for me to show you where the forms are located, the three forms are located on the Maryland Real Estate Commission website. You can scroll down on the home page or you can go to forms and fees. And this is where we have the forms that come from the Real Estate Commission. I am going to be opening the disclosure disclaimer to make sure we are on the same page in terms of what document is Brenda getting into at the present moment. This is only applicable to residential properties. There are seven sellers who are exempt from filling this out, and page one does a good job of telling us which sellers don't need to fill out this form. Two schools of thought. Your broker might say, put it on there, cross it all out to show that it is not applicable. Your broker, another broker school of thought is, if it is not applicable, then why include it? But there's seven sellers there who are exempt from filling out this form. 
Then we get into the conversation of where it starts getting tricky is this question. If the seller is selling the property as is, and I should have done a better job of putting it in a poll. If the seller is selling the property as is in the chat box, do they still need to fill out the disclosure disclaimer? Let me fill it. Let me clean this up. Seller is not one of the seven. Does the seller still need to fill out the disclosure disclaimer? I'm receiving a couple and the people who have responded have it right. Yes. Seller still needs to fill out the disclosure disclaimer if they're not one of the seven that are listed in that particular list, which starts off with an initial sale. There are seven of them that I'm not going to spend time on because you'll do your homework and go look at that particular document. So if the seller is selling the property as is, they still need to fill it out. Now, let me start with where we need to clean up a couple of things on this particular document. On this document, your answer to that question, seller must still provide the information even if they're selling the property as is, is found there. They still need to disclose latent defects and they're disclosing latent defects as they know it as of today and the document tells you what is a latent defect there. Here's where some of the cleaning up would help for this document. When you share it with the seller, and then the seller starts filling out page one because the question, how long have you owned the property, they know. And then they start filling out water supply all the way to the water heater. And then they go to page two and they're like, oh boy, this is a lot of questions. Do I have to fill it out? The answer is yes. Sella, once you start filling out how long you've owned the property, what are you doing? You're disclosing. The moment sellers fill out how long they have owned the property, because I see this a lot. <laughs> you see how long you've owned the property, 18 years, and then everything else is left blank. And then the seller goes and signs page four. The moment the seller fills out how long they've owned the property and tries to attempt what is presented on the bottom of page one, the seller is disclosing. Dear seller, if you don't know the answer, you have the opportunity to check what unknown or does not apply. Dear seller, you're only filling out what you know as of today. Once you fill out everything, including the latent defects that are going to be disclosed on number 19, seller, then you're going to sign it. And then the buyer will acknowledge receipt by signing it at the bottom of page three. So if it was a mistake that the seller did not intend to disclose, agent do your part and make sure that how long you've owned the property is not filled out. Because again, the moment they fill that out, they are disclosing. So now we get to page three, where I'm going to talk about a couple of things. One is page three, and four, sorry, I'm gonna talk about page four. Page three and page four cannot have seller signatures. Dear agent, do, do better. Because when you're using the digital signatures, it's not a human being to take out the signature spots when it's not needed. So there needs to be a conversation as to which one is the seller filling out. And both page three and four can, should not be signed by the seller. It needs to be one or the other, not both. So that's one statement. The other statement is, and this is why I pause. The other conversation is, dear agent, this is not your conversation. This is not your job. This is not your response. Stop it. Stop filling out the response on behalf of the seller. Stop it. This is the seller's responsibility. 
and check with your brokers. They will agree. <laughs> this is not your responsibility, my friend, listing agent. Stop it. So now we get into how do I get it for the seller to fill it out? Guess what? You can still print it out and drop it off at the property. Just another opportunity for you to get to know the property better. You can have it during the listing appointment. You can leave it with them when we're having that conversation. Oh, I want to get the property ready and so forth. Leave it with them. The traditional route, you've printed it out. The other route is, okay, email it to the seller for them to print it out, sign it, and scan it back to you. That still works. And then we get the other school of thought. No, Brenda, I want to move a little bit quicker than that. Okay, if you're going to use the dot loop and I'm gonna talk only about two because that's what I have access to, but no matter which type of contracts filling software you have, the system is going to be similar because all of them, it's going to be a PDF. You put in the spots where the person is going to be signing and checking off. This is where you need to slow down dear agent and pay attention. Let me answer to those who use dot loop. If you're using dot loop, then you will check off just the document that you need for the seller to fill out. This is the disclosure disclaimer. And then this is where you need to slow down, dear agent, is before I send it to Zara for her to fill out this particular document, I am going to drop down on the right-hand side and have her fill it out and sign it. So I'm going to select Zara, my listing, I'm sorry, my seller is going to fill out the disclosure disclaimer and she will be the one filling out the entire document. If she decides to fill out the disclaimer, she's the one that's going to put the yes or no to the latent defect and put in a comment on the box. This is Zara, the seller that's going to be doing that. I am facilitating it by checking off the option to fill it out and sign it. So this is on dot loop. The other one that I'm familiar with is Skyslope. So Skyslope is another product that some of you might be familiar with. Again, I know there are others. I'm limited in terms of access to all of them. But no matter what, you're able to get it to the other person for them to make the decision, fill it out and sign it. When I use Skyslope, this is where Skyslope, how it works is a little bit different to where I need to have the conversation up front with the seller, which one are we doing? The disclosure or the disclaimer? And then usually I am asked, well then Brenda, how do you guide them? What I do is I ask them, seller, if you're going to buy the property, which one would you like? Which one would you appreciate? Do you care whether they disclosed? Do you care whether they disclaimed? Whatever seller you respond, then let's return the favor on our side. You get to decide which one we're going to fill out. Either way, you're going to have the conversation of latent defects. So in Skyslope, you have to have the conversation first, which one the seller is going to do. And then when you're picking up the disclosure disclaimer, you're going to then, if they're going to disclaim, Skyslope gives me the opportunity for me to send it to my seller, Stephanie, for her to fill it out and sign it. So what happened with Stephanie, once I sent it, she filled it out, so I set it up for her to fill out disclaimer because that's what she picked, and she had to disclose the latent defect. So all of this was filled out by Stephanie, the seller, not me, because when there's a case, they're looking at all this stuff, who filled out this spot. So Stephanie filled out that information, and then we put it in the MLS. So I'm going to say it again with my mother tone. Stop filling this out on behalf of your sellers. This is not your conversation. Let's now go to the contract itself and we're moving right along. We'll be done soon. Sorry, my question was that the entire form um, before this, that paragraph 
do we sit with the seller and complete it together? You can, but but I'm staying but away from that conversation because when the buyer sues that there were stuff that should have been disclosed and the seller somehow forgot that I said, no, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not. But okay, you can, so, I'm not. <laughs> okay, I, I, I haven't done this. So I was just making it clear that this form needs to be completed by the seller and only the seller. Okay, thank you. And if you fill it out, talk to your manager and attorney to see how much coverage you have when you're the one filling it out on their behalf. Okay, thank you. Now, the question is, if they disclaim signing page four, mm -hmm. do you think the other pages ought to be lined through? I don't. I don't. But a, but a lawyer, another lawyer school of thought might be, yes, cross it out so that there's no there's no possibility of it being filled out. I've seen both styles. I don't I don't cross it out. Keep in mind that if you cross out any pages, then they each crossed out page has to be initialed by all parties. <laughs> so see, that's why I don't cross it out. <laughs> Thank you, Roseanne. <laughs> Thank you. Now all of this. I'm going to always have the disclaimer of what? Your broker is the final say. Your broker is your final say because your errors and omission insurance is all under them. So your broker has the final say. Let's get into the conversation of the as is. When we're going through the meets or rather the way they say the phrase is what the meat and potatoes of our transactions, are stemmed off from the sales contract or rather the contract. So when we are looking at, for example, today, the residential contract of sale that we're focusing on for Manland Realtors, it's 11 pages. We're not going through all 11 pages. I'm just picking on a couple of the paragraphs. The first one that we're going to get into is the conversation of inspection. So you have your 11 pages. You can always access that from the Maryland Realtors website. Let's talk about inspections. And when you're talking about inspection, this is where they are. Let, let's see how we do with this one. On paragraph 12, it's asking, is there any property inspection being done? So if there's a property inspection being done in terms of rights to cancel the contract, whether it's a as is or what I will call a regular property inspection addendum, if the buyer is going to do any type of inspection as a contingency or an opportunity to just have an idea what's going on and continue with the transaction, 12 needs to be initialed that yes, they're doing some form of inspection. And then you have an addenda addressing what type. Is it as is with the right to terminate or not? or is it quote unquote, a regular property inspection? So 12 is there. And then we have the inclusions where you're checking off everything that's going to be included. Let's go to the next conversation, which is normally paragraph 19 and paragraph, I believe it's 25. When we have the as is conversation, this paragraph is automatically deleted, negated, redacted, not applicable. When the person does the as is, the conversation of lack of a better word, what we normally use is termite inspection. All of this doesn't apply once the person elects to have the as is addendum. The other one that also doesn't apply is 22. In terms of the condition of the property also is not something where the seller has to leave a broom swept clean. It's how you sew it. And guess what? It's not when you sew it. The contract usually calls for what? The date of contract acceptance. So just be aware of that. For buyers and buyer agents, it's not when you sew it. It's based on when the contract was accepted. So keep that in mind. 
let's go to the as is conversation. The as is addendum as presented here for your visual is one page and it covers two choices for the buyer. Sometimes you will have the seller saying right up front, we are selling the property as is, we should expect the addendum. If for example, the seller put it in the MLS, which is an advertisement that we're selling the property as is, and the contract, the whole packet, never had an as-is addendum, then guess what, seller, e e listing agent? Yeah, that conversation of as-is is only in the MLS, so that is why we are saying anything in the MLS is advertisement. It's only binding when it's in the contract. So if listing agent, seller, selling as-is, maybe add the addendum up front, or when the buyer is put in, in the offer, listing agent, make sure that the as-is addendum is in that packet. The as-is addendum has two choices. You just want to know what's happening. The as-is without inspection, you're taking it as-is, you sew it, you're not doing anything, you're just going to move on. And if you do, then you're not having the right of termination. Here we've terminated or redacted or removed paragraph 19 termite. And we've also cleaned up a little bit on 22 to where you're not getting it broom swept clean. You still have the opportunity to do your walkthrough within the five day window prior to settlement. B is the one that comes up. So B is going to be the one that I slow down a little bit. As is with inspection and right to terminate. I'm finding out what's happening. I'm preparing myself as to what I need to get my or what I'm getting myself into. If it's scary, then I am moving on to something else. So here the buyer is saying that they want to do an inspection with this number of days and the number of days here, my friends, is what? You do the inspection and the report is, or, or whatever decision, let me clean that up. The de decision is told to the other side within this time frame. If you have five days, you're doing the inspection within the five days and the decision is being communicated within the totality of the five days. Seller, when we agree to this, you're still going to have the utilities on for the person to inspect and find out what it is that they're getting themselves into. Here's where we need to clean up a little bit. And if you have questions, please ask. Here's now what is happening. <laughs> what is happening is as is were thrown as a conversation in the last year, almost every property is being sold as is. And some, it was a strategy for the offer to be accepted and some for the seller is for them not to worry about fixing stuff. So as is, is a normal conversation in this market. Here's the challenge we have. As is inspection is done, buyer gets the report, buyer's like, mm -mm, I'm not dealing with this. So buyer communicates through the buyer agent to the other side, we're walking away. And seller is like, well, why? Can we now talk, right? That's happening. Seller is like, can we now talk? And what is it that we can talk about to make us continue on this particular journey? So now there's a conversation between the buyer and the seller, and yet the property was being sold as is with the right to terminate. Buyer gave notice, hey, I'm walking away, seller and is saying, no, how about we talk? So while we are talking, now buyer agent is listing out some of the things that communication between the agents is acceptable to both sides. It might be everything, it might be some, and then maybe there's money being exchanged. So now here's where we pause. This is an issue that Maryland Realtors is aware of. The pause that we're going to have is some of us are going to then pull up the property inspection notice. This is where I'm presenting the challenge. The property inspection notice 
which has lines as to what the buyers are going to do, and I'll blow this up in a couple of seconds, is only applicable if we included the property inspection addendum. What does that mean? Let me start off. If we included, sorry, if we included the property inspection addendum, four pages, spelling out what it is that we're doing, then we're going to put our stuff in this particular document. This document is only applicable if we included the property inspection addendum. So now what, Brenda? If we have the as is that has been included, and now the sellers and the buyers want to have a conversation, and yet it was the as is. So this document, when I blow it up, the property inspection notice is only applicable if we included the property inspection addendum. So buyer agent, what do you do? Talk to your broker and potentially where you're going to end up, which is a scary part, is going to be putting stuff in a blank addendum because this document only protects us when we have the property inspection addendum as part of the conversation to begin with. This is where you're going to go to your broker, see whether they have a blank addendum or your associations and see whether they have a blank addendum, whatever you're putting in that blank addendum. I'm not an attorney. You're going to have it reviewed to make sure that it is what everyone is seeking. Whenever there's money involved as part of this conversation, we know that we have the change in terms addendum that is going to be the conversation that we're having when we have money being offered from the seller to go towards the transaction. Questions, comments, feedback, because that has been an issue and Maryland Realtors is aware of it. I don't know if you're going to come up with a form that's going to address the scenario. It's being discussed this month. I actually had this happen with the as is and I kept telling the listing agent that we could not use the property inspection notice once we had decided to make changes. And I sent them this form and they really didn't want to fill it out. So I had to get the broker involved because I understood that that form, the property the PIN mm -hmm. um, form only applied if I like you had. That PIN. Okay, I'm going right. to start using that. Thank you. Uh huh. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understood that it only applied if you actually had an original inspection that wasn't as is. Exactly. And so, I mean, it was a, it was a bit of a hassle because um, I, I was being told that, no, that that was incorrect. I was like, that's not how I read it. I know. I know. We don't need. And then, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for sharing. Any others? Yeah. Brenda? Yes. Going back a little bit. Um, with the termite um, part of the contract, the paragraph, uh -huh. we don't have to cross that out, right? Because the as is addendum says that it doesn't apply the yeah. same way with paragraph 22. Correct. We don't have to strike those. That's taken care of in that addendum. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. you run into that. I know. I know, yeah. I know. Yes. That's why yes. we had 22 of us here. Yes, yes. Now, I recently had a listing agent tell me we were going as is with inspections that the buyers could not do termite inspection um, because, you know, that paragraph didn't apply. And I said, I the seller doesn't have to address it, but we can have any inspection we want. Um, and that's correct. Yes, yes. So you're correct. Thank you for bringing that up. So when it's an as-is inspection, do them all. The termite conversation or wood destroying whatever insects only is going to affect the seller if it is not removed and the seller would be responsible for fixing it. As is, I'm doing any type of inspection I want, including the termite. Yes, yes. Right. Thank you for that. 
Thank one you. minute to briefly talk about the first time home buyer one because that keeps coming up and then I'm going to look at what is in the chat. The first time home buyer mail and addendum does not apply if the cost of being split. The first time home buyer addendum does not apply. All you do is check off the box that says that this person is a first time home buyer in page 11 of, no, 10 of our sales contract. The document, the first time Maryland home buyer transfer recordation addendum only applies if they are agreeing to something different. What are they agreeing to something different? Buyer as part of their conversation is saying, don't worry, seller, I'm gonna pay for this just for you to accept my offer because you're not going to be paying for that. However, how it's calculated, it's still gonna be the same in terms of the altar or the closing statement. And then we have the discount that the first time home buyer is going to get on the state transfer tax. That's still gonna be calculated the same. This is only when things are different. Maybe they argued that, or rather they negotiated that the seller is only gonna pay 25% of it and the buyer is gonna pay the other 75%. This is only applicable when the transfer costs are not split. Automatically in the contract, it addresses that it's going to be automatically be split. So you only need this if it is a different conversation. When have I seen it as a different conversation? when somebody's probably purchasing a um, new construction and the builder is saying, I'm not paying those costs, buyer, you're responsible. And then some of your foreclosures, the entities are exempt from paying those fees. So then that's when you might have this conversation. Let me see what you have and we'll be ending with, let's connect. Go to Brenda Kasuva and we shall find each other there. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you next Friday. I'm going to address the questions that are currently in the chat box. So let me see. Um, first time home buyer addendum, it doesn't apply if the state transfer cost is being split. Yes. Okay, got it. Thanks. So the lender, is, so her question, which is a good one, what happens in the as is without inspection and the lender requires a pest inspection? So that is where, uh, Roseanne, you and I can bounce off each other. I'm going to safely assume this is now a financing conversation. That's, so how have you addressed it? I'm not, but I was just curious what would I've never had an as is without inspections, only with inspections. Right. I'm going to say now I would argue this is Brenda speaking, not a broker. I would argue that now it's a financing conversation. So in order if the buyer cannot get the loan without this inspection, then now it's a conversation to do with financing. And yeah, but I what if the uh -huh. What if the seller says you've struck the, the pest I inspection? I know. I'm not doing that. I know. That's why I'm writing it down. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'll bring this up next time we have the statewide forms. Yeah, thank you. I'll bring it up. I don't have an answer other than what I just shared. <laughs> There's a couple of, of problems with the forms. The I'll first being redundancy. Yes. And, and they're working on that. They work. They actually have a task force. Craig Wolf, the current president, mm -hmm. set up a task force and he's working on that. Yeah. Oh boy, that, that's scary. So Sherry got one where all the docu all the check boxes and the first time home buyer addendum were all checked. Oh my goodness. Okay. Missy's not here, but she had presented one that I'm going to read. I still do terminate if as is with right to walk time frame regardless. Yeah, as long as you terminated within the walk within the time frame that was put in the addendum, then you're good. 